Please open your Bibles. Once again, we have been spending several weeks in the book of Revelation. Many people run away from it. I felt called to it in a, in a certain way as we've been talking about the vision of victory that God has for us. Well, we've not looked at some of the more frightening parts of it, but we have looked at some of the, the brightest spots, and I don't know of anything brighter than the very end, Revelation 21 and 22. We're obviously not going to read both of those chapters, but I sure want us to go through and pick out some key parts of these chapters to help us savor what God really has in store for us. You know, usually if something appears to be too good to be true, well, it probably is. Such as, you have just won an all-expense paid vacation to a certain place, but there's strings attached. Aha, uh -huh, there's a catch. Or you get this email or letter, you know, there's somebody who left all these millions of dollars in their estate, no place else to put the money, but you know what, we want to put it in your bank account. All you got to do is give us this retainer fee. Aha, uh -huh. it's too good to be true. It would be easy to think about Revelation 21 and 22 as being too good to be true. It's too good not to be true. This is the ultimate destiny that God has for us. And I just get excited thinking about it, much less delving into it. Let's take a look at the first seven verses of chapter 21. Again, John the Apostle, who saw this great vision, says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, or the dwelling of God, is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write. For these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. He doesn't get any better than this. The Apostle John had been on quite a journey with this vision that we call the Revelation. Going back to the beginning, a vision that was given to John, the last surviving apostle of Jesus, probably a very lonely man on an isolated island called Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And what an amazing vision he has seen. He first of all saw the glorified Christ. He had seen him for a short time before he ascended to heaven but a majestic vision of the glorified Christ in chapter 1. John heard the personal message of Jesus to seven churches that he was faithful to convey to them. John saw a great, great vision of the heavenly worship scene, God upon his throne, and he saw the Lamb as though it were slain that came onto the scene. John saw the unfolding of some terrifying events as scrolls and seals and, and uh, trumpets were blown and so forth. He saw some terrifying scenes, but he also saw, saw some wonderful scenes of victory. He saw the rise of an unspeakable evil world ruler and system. He also saw its destruction. He saw the most detailed vision anyone has seen of the majestic, powerful return of Jesus Christ to the earth. He saw the resurrection of believers. He saw a great 1,000 year government led by Christ and by the people of God. He saw the defeat of Satan 
and of all the enemies of God. He saw the great judgment day. And now he saw a new heaven and a new earth. It is interesting, last week we looked at that great judgment day. Chapter 20, verse 11 talks about the fact that there's that scene of a throne and earth and heaven had fled away. Now John sees in chapter 21 a new heaven and a new earth. That word new is a very important word. I want to linger on that just for a moment and make sure we understand exactly what's being said. Because this word new literally means fresh. It literally means superior to that which it succeeds. And I think verse 5 that we just read really helps us especially with it because God himself said, I am making all things new. That is important. Because he did not say, I am making all new things. No. God doesn't plan to scrap the project he started in Genesis. So he's not discarding the whole thing and making new things. No, what it says is I'm making all things brand new, fresh, superior to what has been there in the past. I stress that because it's so important we understand this word new, which literally means renewed. So God says, I am renewing all things. I am restoring all things. He is not saying I'm replacing all things. It takes us to a very familiar verse, a very important verse in Acts 3, verse 21, where it says concerning Jesus, heaven must receive him until the times of the restoration, the renewal of all things which God spoke about by the mouth of all of his holy prophets from the beginning. The consistent plan of God, I'm making everything new. And of course, us as well, resurrected beings, making us new, better than we've ever been in the past. And so God's plan comes full circle. Things started out with an earthly paradise in the book of Genesis where God would join Adam and Eve and walk in the garden in the cool of the day. God was with our first parents in a perfect earthly paradise. You come to chapter 21 and chapter 22. Earth and heaven are now restored to the perfection that it was at the beginning and now God literally joins heaven to earth. God makes all things new. Not new things, but renews all things. God joins us on the earth, not the other way around, as is so commonly taught. Verse 1 says, there will no longer be any sea. When I first read that, I'm disappointed. I was hoping for oceanfront property in the kingdom. If that's what it means, I'm disappointed from the get-go. I don't think that's what it means. I don't think it means no longer bodies of water, no more oceans, no, no longer sea in that sense. It's probably very figurative because there's a figurative reference to the sea earlier in Revelation, chapter 13, verse 1, describing this beast, this worldwide ruler that rises up, it says, out of the sea. Does that mean you've got a sea monster that rules the world for the last seven? No, I don't think it means that at all. Rising up out of the turmoil of humanity. We relate to that. We understand that. Humanity is in a tremendous amount of turmoil today. The rising and the falling of nations and leaders and peoples. And so seizing that time of unrest, there's a, a great world ruler that will rise up. But I don't think that's what it means at all here. There will no longer be that turmoil among the nations and peoples. Now I'm encouraged by that. I still can possibly have oceanfront property in the kingdom. But I don't have to worry about aggressive nations and war and all that sort of a thing. I think that's really what he means. There is no longer any sea. John saw a new Jerusalem descending out of heaven like a bride. How descriptive and how beautiful. The new Jerusalem, the perfect city from above coming down to the earth. It lines up so well with what Jesus said during his earthly ministry. In John 14, verses 2 and 3, before he suffered and died and was resurrected and ascended, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. 
this is it. The new Jerusalem. I think he's been in preparation for that great city. And so he's going to come back to the earth, receive us to himself. So it's the fulfillment of that great promise. Verse 3, as we go back and take a look at that, uh, he heard a loud voice. This is a scene that John has seen, but in verse 3, he hears a loud voice. I think a loud voice means pay attention. And so the loud voice says, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men. God is going to dwell among us. We will be his people. God himself will be among us. That point is repeated several times to indicate to us the ultimate destiny is God joining heaven with this earth. God's going to come here when things are right, when things are ready. And I think that point could not be made more clear. Verse 4 is the tenderest scene of all. I have read this passage at more funerals than I can count because it's the most appropriate passage to read. When people need comfort, this is it. Take a close look at what is being said in verse 4. This is God being referred to. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And not only that, God is going to put an end to death because mourning, crying, pain, those first things associated with this age are done away with permanently forever. But the tenderness of that scene, God taking hands and wiping away tears from our eyes. You know how God could have done it because he has the full authority to do so. God could have commanded and said, no more tears, that's it. Just the same way in the very beginning, God could have said, let there be man, let there be woman. He could have spoken an authoritative word and it would have come into existence. What does this tell you about our God? The God who could have given a word that would have been very effective to stop tears and mourning and crying and pain, but instead God takes his hand and wipes away the tears. Makes you love God that much more when you see his tender compassion for each one of us. So when you think about verse 4 and all the things that are done away with, can you begin to imagine life without tears, without death, without mourning, without pain? Can you imagine it? Because I can't. I really can't. I can't wrap my mind around that because those things weigh so heavy on us today we can scarce imagine when the burden is finally lifted maybe we'll realize how much of a burden it was but that's so much an integral part of life today isn't it how many times are we moved to tears how many of us have been affected by death every one of us we've lost people near and dear to us all of us and so the mourning associated with it, pain and even the general sense we all have got some kind of burden that we carry Imagine if you could and would, it's all gone. <laughs> It'll all be gone in the perfect age. God's very personal message is found in verses 6 and 7 where he says, It is done, brought to completion. With these things, it is done. It takes me back to Jesus on the cross. You know his last words? It is finished. For God to say it was done, Jesus needed to say it was finished because Sin had to be dealt with on the cross. And so that paved the way for God to say, now the whole thing has come to completion. It is totally, absolutely done. All is completed when those words are spoken. We will have arrived at everything God has ever designed for all of us. And you can take God's word for it because he speaks of himself as the Alpha and the Omega. God is the perfect, absolute beginning and end. And so his plan and his promise totally completed. And we then can drink of the water that truly and permanently satisfies as he invites us to do so. It takes me back to Jesus and the woman at the well, right? John 4, 14, where he said to this woman steeped in sin who was there at that well, whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again ever. He was referring to this ultimate fulfillment in the age to come. 
I think again of Acts chapter 3. We read one verse a moment ago, but verses 19 and 20, where it speaks about repenting and turning back, that your sins be wiped away, that seasons of refreshing, that sounds like water in a sense, seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus, who's been appointed to you, as Messiah. This is it when it is truly, truly done. And so verse 7, he says, he who overcomes will inherit these things. Ah, oh, there is a bit of a catch because we got to be an overcomer. It sounds too good to be true, but that's not the catch that throws the whole thing out. No, he just simply says, this is what I've got in store for you, but this is your incentive this is the vision of victory that gives you the incentive to be an overcomer. And I sure hope that this passage and everything we've been looking at the last few weeks stirs you up to say, more than ever, I want to be an overcomer. No way do I want to miss out on the greatest that God has that we are looking at here. We didn't read verses 9 and 10, and there's a lot of verses we're not going to read here today, but if you looked down at verses 9 and 10... We understand this new Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven appears to be both a literal city, but it's also descriptive and maybe figurative of the church, the bride of Christ. Everything else that follows seems to fit in both of those categories. But if you jump down in chapter 21 to verses 22 to 27 to the end of the chapter, John saw that there was no temple in the new Jerusalem, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed." And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. No temples, no church buildings, no tabernacles, no need for such things. God himself will be there to illuminate us. The Lamb, it says, will be the lamp. So there'll be no need for sunlight, no need for moonlight, Apparently, there'll be no hostility among the nations, and the fact that nations get mentioned tells me that apparently there will be nations in the coming age, but they're certainly not going to be at each other's throats like they are today. So there will be nations, but they'll somehow learn finally to get along in the perfect government to come. The first two verses of chapter 22, John says, He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. A great river of life flowing out from the throne of God. There's a song we sometimes sing, an old hymn about that river. And uh, there will be this great river that flows out, and there will be the tree of life. Oh yeah, the tree of life. That was way back in the first paradise in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life that was used to sustain our first parents. Well, the tree of life is not done away with. God brings it back in the perfect age. And in verses 3 and 4 here, it says, There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. At last, at last we see our great God. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says that now we see indistinctly, as in a mirror, but then face to face. This is the then when we see our God face to face. You remember Jesus in the Beatitudes said, Matthew 5, 8, the pure in heart are blessed for they will see God. This will be the day when we see our God. Verses 6 and 7, he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Once again, it's established. These are absolutely trustworthy words. 
Not too good to be true, but indeed true, as good as they sound. And there you have the absolute promise of the sudden return of Christ. Jesus says, I am coming quickly three times, verse 7. And also verse 12 and verse 20. Three times to make sure we understand it is settled. Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. When I come, it will be so fast you can't even begin to imagine it. I am coming quickly. And verse 17 is the greatest invitation of all. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. You don't get a better offer than that. Come and partake freely of what is being offered to you. And verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Jesus again says, I'm coming quickly. And apparently John wanted to agree with that because I think John injects those words here, Come, Lord Jesus. And I don't think those words convey the passion, the longing behind it any more than when we say it. Come, please, come, Lord Jesus. When Jesus said he would come, John is saying, Oh, I so much want that. And when we hear these words, aren't we saying the same thing? Come, Lord Jesus. There is such a longing within us. The older we get and the worse things get in this world, oh, come Lord Jesus. That takes us to the end of the book of Revelation. It takes us to the end of the Bible. And you know, typically if you're reading a book, when you get to the end of the book, what do you do? You close it, you move on to other things. Do we do that when we come to the end of Revelation? I hope not. I think there's a lot more to go back to beyond that. We do not set it aside. We've seen the vision of victory that motivates us. That I want to go back to the rest of this thing. And I want to learn about all those things that I need to do to be faithful. I want to go back and review all the promises that are made. I want to stay more on track than ever before. Because I've come to the end and I see what God really has in store. And I'm more excited than ever to see that. And I sure hope that has been our response as we have been looking these past few weeks in the book of Revelation. As we said in the very beginning, God created. God created according to Genesis. In Revelation, he perfectly recreates. God does not just recreate the physical world and the physical universe, but God recreates you and I. So we say God is in the process always of making all things new. God is ever renewing and restoring. So here's a great takeaway that I see out of all this. If we see the completion of God's renewing process here in the book of Revelation, then it calls us to participate in the process. That's what I see here maybe more than anything else. And so the, the purpose that God has is to make us new today. This is God's purpose right now. He wants us in the process of being made new in, in anticipation of the completion of it we've read here. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. I find that both depressing and encouraging. My outer self, as is yours, all of us who are mortals are wasting away. We're aging right along with the natural world. There's a curse that this world is under and we are under it. Our outer man is wasting away. Revelation reminds us about the renewal that's going on within us. And so we are being transformed even now and we are destined to be completely transformed along with God's renewed creation when all the process is complete. So there's a key thought for us to think about here today, and that is, how am I being renewed today? If God's in the restoration business, how am I being restored and renewed today? A number of ways, I think. First of all, through participation in a renewing Christian community, because that's what we are. The church, the body of Christ, is a renewal community. We're being made new. The kingdom is beginning to be fleshed out within the body of Christ even now. 
And so individually, we are being renewed in our participation within the church. We are being renewed through communication with God through Christ today as we seek to know our Father better through His Son, Jesus Christ, and to know Him better as well. We're being renewed by the Holy Spirit within us, the down payment of what is to come. We're being renewed through our commitment to read, to study, to apply the words of Scripture. And I hope Revelation takes us back to the rest of the Bible to do that very thing. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, He saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewal of the Holy Spirit. We're being made new by that Spirit in Romans 12 too, a very familiar verse. Don't be conformed to this world, the decaying world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So it is a promise as well as a call to be renewed in our minds. I might add, renewal is not automatic. Just because the promise is there, we've got to participate. We cannot indulge in the deteriorating mindset and lifestyle of a dying world and expect to be renewed in our minds. It just doesn't work that way. I guess I'm thinking if I make a commitment that I want to be healthier physically, it is not an automatic because I want to if I choose the path of doing that to be a couch potato where I lay around and eat junk food and watch endless hours of TV or all this time on, on social media, whatever, I am not going to be healthier. I've got to participate in a process. And so if God wants us to be renewed, we've got to participate in that process. Here's another important one, and I've been touched by this several times in recent weeks and studies. God's purpose today in renewal is to make lost people found and renewed as well. Maybe that speaks as much as anything out of what we've just been looking at. God wants everybody to be part of this. It's not an automatic. Not everyone will. But if people would respond, this is what God has for every individual. I think back in Isaiah 49, verse 6, a prophecy of the Messiah, where God said to him, I will make you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. What goes for Christ goes for the followers of Christ. This tells us God wants to use us in this renewal restoration process to be a light, to be able to call others to him and to this great and wonderful plan we've read about, which fits so well with 2 Corinthians 5, two verses, 18 and 20, that God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. The God who's in the restoration business wants to use us as his ambassadors of that process. God wants to appeal to lost people that we know that are around us. He wants to use us to bring them in so they can be part of this great plan that we look at here today. Two verses that remind us of his will. 2 Peter 2.9, not wishing for any to perish, but all should reach repentance, and in 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God will never violate free will, but God in his renewal dream and plan would sure like to call every person in to salvation to Christ and to enjoy this scene that we have just read about. Book of Revelation reminds us that it's all ultimately going to end well. I don't know about you, but I needed that reassurance here in recent times. That's why I was drawn to share this series with you. I know it's not going to be easy to the end of this age because Revelation also tells us that. But it will end well, and these are faithful and true words. You can absolutely count on it. So we come to the end of the Bible and the end of Revelation. We don't close the book. No, instead, we reaffirm our commitment to participate in the process that God will bring to completion on that day. May we be stirred up to even greater zeal to do that very thing. Amen? Amen. Amen.